Praise God. But our thought for the week, our thought for the week, as we go into this Labor Day, we need to set aside a designated period of time each day and make an appointment with God and keep that appointment as if we were meeting with the most important person in the world, because we are. Again, set aside a designated period of time each day and make an appointment with God. And then, church, keep that appointment as if you were meeting with the most important person in the world. Because you are. Amen. Not always easy. But yes, it's necessary. It is necessary. Hallelujah. I know we live in a world where everything is replaced in the name of Jesus and the will of God. But yes, our yes is necessary. Our yes is necessary. Because it's in our yes that God is able to keep us safe from danger, seen and unseen. It's in our yes that God is able to watch over us and cover us and to keep us well and safe. It's in our yes. It's in our yes to God. Now we know that God is no respecter of persons, and you know, and He will keep you safe until you can get saved. But God keeps us, keeps us. And I was just thinking about that. We are only here because of his mercy. And we're, the mercy only works over our life because those mercies are new every morning. So when you give up, when you get up in the morning, that means that God has given you another chance of whatever you did that day. Whatever you did the day before, he has forgiven you by giving you another chance to repent. So you operating on new mercy and new grace every day. You're not operating off the old grace. God loves you so much that he renews his grace for us. He renews it. Who wouldn't want to say yes to a God like that? We want to say yes. Hallelujah. He loves us. I, I, I love that fact that he loves us so much that he renews his, cover, his covenant daily for us. He starts us over at zero every day. That's why we ought to tell God thank you. We ought to tell God thank you because he resets the score. We have a God that's willing to reset the score for us. Glory to God. As we go into the message this morning, <clears throat> what a fitting song for a fitting message. Amen. Like Jesus. And so I'm going to pray <clears throat> that God would cover us this morning and not only cover us, but that he would be here with us as we receive his word. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus, God, we come to you this morning just to tell you thank you. God, we thank you for this time of the word and receiving the rhema word for our lives. God, we ask, we know that your word is already blessed. So God, we ask you now to bless us, oh God, to receive the word. God, we ask you to unclog our ears, unfoggy our eyes, God, and unclutter our hearts, that this word may be sold on good ground. God, we ask that this word become revelation to us to apply it to our lives so that we can be saved, healed, delivered, set free, and changed. God, we give you glory over this word, and I thank you for just speaking to us, loving us so much that you would speak to us. We give you all glory, honor, and praise on everything that we ask and so and so it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I will be reading in your hearing. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Um, this is a scripture that everyone knows. Everyone has quoted it. Everyone has preached a message from it. Hallelujah. However, God always has something that, that he needs to say to the earth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. He always has something that he wants to say to us as a people. God is always talking. And the question becomes, who will hear him? This is why he had to say in Revelation chapter 3, when he was speaking to John, this is why he had to say to John that he that hath an ear hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. Amen. So you have to have an ear to hear what God is saying unto you. 
Amen. You are the church. You are the church. Amen. Glory to God. You are the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And as we receive this message this morning, I'm going to put it here on your screen that, so that we can read together. Amen. The word of the Lord. Amen. As I share this. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Starting at the first verse. Christ, humility, and greatness. Your life in Christ makes you strong. And his love comforts you. You have fellowship with the spirit and you have kindness and compassion for one another. I urge you then to make me completely happy by being having the same thoughts, sharing the same love, and being in one soul and mind. Do not do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast. But be humble towards one another. Yes, God, always considering one another better than yourself. And look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. The attitude you have is of the one that, that Christ Jesus had. He has always had a nature of God. But he did not think that by force he should try to remain as equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and he took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to a higher place above and gave him the name that is greater than any name. So in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven and on earth and in the world below will fall on their knees and will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord is blessed. Amen. Such a fitting message for a fitting time. Um, God started cultivating this word in me, um, and and when as of Wednesday, and it's so funny that, that to prophetically explain this, when God gives me a word, He puts it right here in my belly, and it's it's as if I can feel the letters of the scripture and where they're found wrote in my belly. I can feel like the word is inscripted in my belly. Um, Jesus said this in John chapter 7, verse 38. He said, if you believe on me, as the scripture has said, that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And I believe that that is how the word of the Lord comes to us. Amen. Glory to God is in our spirit, in our soul, in the belly of our being. So this word came to me and God was saying, he was sharing this with me. And it was so funny that he was sharing this, started actually sharing this on Tuesday, that this work kept regurgitating in my spirit. And I didn't know why, but I was a part of a um, a conversation. And in this conversation, I had made a comment. And when I had made a comment, um, somebody had replied, but we're not Jesus. But we're not Jesus. And I kind of looked because, you know, there are some people that, you know, you're like, you know, you look at it and you're like, yeah, they have a, a, a burning, a burning for God. And this is not to say that, that nobody has a burning for God. But I was like, but that is my response. My response in my mind was, but that is our mission, is that God wants us to walk like Jesus. We may not be him. Hallelujah. But he is our example. And so it was funny that God. Regur it was it was just amazing how God put that in my spirit. God put that in my spirit. That we must we must be crucified with Christ. This is what Paul said. And to become crucified with Christ, we have to be one with him. This does not mean that we are God and we can do it by ourselves. We can never do anything outside of God. That's what John 15 tells us. However, this is our goal, is to be like Jesus. Can I get a witness that this is our goal, to be like Jesus? It says this, your life in Christ makes you strong, and his love comforts you. You have fellowship with the Spirit, and you have kindness and compassion for one another. Paul was writing this to the Philippian church, and he was writing this letter because there's some things that he wanted to remind him of. Amen. He wanted to tell him up. Um, and so in this letter, it's funny how people, they read these. Even though we read these as chapters, these are small, like, letters. 
Amen, glory to God. This is what happened is the divine counsel put them in number form, and now we have what we have. Amen, glory to God. But these were letters that Paul was writing. Amen. So can you imagine getting a letter saying, uh, this is the second part of his letter, second paragraph of his letter, and he is saying to them, he says, your life in Christ makes you strong, and his love comforts you. You have fellowship with the Spirit, and you have kindness and compassion for one another. So what he's saying, he is noticing the point of what they have for one another. And that's what I love about the body of Christ is that although there are sketchy things going on in, in churches across America, is that there are some people that who are strong and have the love of God and that, that comfort one another and that fellowship, have fellowship with the spirit and kindness and compassion for one another. And that's why I openly thank God for our church here. And if you're watching this on YouTube, our church is called Faith and Praise Fellowship Church uh, Incorporated. Amen. Glory to God. Um, what I love about it is this. Um, God doesn't count numbers, but he makes numbers count. Amen. Glory to God. And where there's always been compassion, there's always been fellowship, and there's always been the spirit of God. And we have always tried to do things in compassion for one another. And this is our aim as a people. Amen. Glory to God. And, and, and it said in the, in the last days, the love of many will wax cold. And what we can know about that scripture is that it didn't say the love of uh, it didn't say the love of some people, but it said the love of many. So this means in and out of the body of Christ. And that is the part about it that is scary because when you can look in a church of today and you can find no love, there is something wrong because God is love. If there is no love in your church, then God is not in your church. I'm making this strong statement, but beloved, this is what the word of God says, that he is love. And what do we know about love? Love is, is kind. Love is patient. That means that love don't just give up on people. I had to learn that myself, that even though there are some people in my life that has done things to me, I could not give up on them if I say I have the love of God. And that's what we as people have to know today. I know we in a season and we want to write everybody off, but the love of God requires that we have patience. The love of God requires that we be long suffering. It requires that we endure. It said it's patient. It's kind. It does not seek itself. That means that even though you want someone to love you back, it doesn't say, well, you're supposed to love me. you supposed to check. Because guess what? If we do what God has called us to do, then even if that person doesn't show us any love back, God got somebody down the road that's going to say, hey, I see what you're doing. I know what you're doing. And I love you for it because you have this, you have that. God will allow somebody to come along and hallelujah and give to you what you poured out. Hallelujah. We praise God for that. So. It said that it does not do things for selfish ambition. That means love doesn't do things to uh, paying over somebody's head and say, hey, I did this for you. Remember when I did this? You know how people are. I did this for you. And I did, and, you know, and that's, and that I've learned from working in a private school setting that it is an immature, is a characteristic of an immature parent where you treat the child as though they owe you. Amen. Glory to God. And and I want to share this, amen, while I'm even on, on live being recorded right now, because this is a bad thing that we have in our community and most especially the African-American community. Hear me, beloved. If you are a parent, your child does not owe you. Amen. Glory to God. Because let me tell you something. When we deal with this thing called birth and conception, children cannot get themselves here. There must be a channel. There must be an act. And we know what that act is. You were the one who willingly laid down. You were the one who willingly uh, pushed and pumped, for lack of better words. You were the one. You were the one that decided to do that in your rage of passion and fiery fury. And now you have a child. But that child does not owe you because why? God made you to be the example of his love to that child. God made you, we, 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 and, and the parents, they want to say, well, you owe me because I did this for you, and I did that for you. That was what you were supposed to do. 
This is what you were supposed to do. I know it's tight, but it's right. That's what you're supposed to do. And so, beloved, if you're upset about it, then you need to know that you shouldn't have laid down and did what you did. I'm just keeping it real. I'm keeping it real. Now, so do I believe that children should have a gratitude? Yes, I do. I believe that they should have a gratitude for the things that was done. However, we are not supposed to hold people responsible for being owed for what we have done. That's why the word of God tells us to owe man, no man nothing but love. And if you got a charge for love, then something is wrong. Don't care who you are. Don't care who you are. I'm just talking this morning. I'm just talking this morning because we need this. We need to hear this as a people. We need to hear this. And beloved, I hope that, that if you're hearing this part right now, that you go and hug your child and ask them to forgive you. Ask him to forgive you because we owe no man nothing but love. Amen. That's what I love about love is it, it, it's it's supposed to be unselfish. It rejo now it rejoices in the tr in the truth. Amen. Glory to God. But it, it it and it also endures. And so Paul was saying, I know that you are are these things. I know that you have these things. And that's why God love love should be found in our churches. We write people off. We say we done. We don't want to deal with them. We go the other way. We don't talk to them. And we push them off. But God is saying, no, no, no. What if I treated you that way? What if I did that to you? What if you did something offensive to me, like had a wrong thought about somebody, and I decided not to hear your prayer? I decided not to even look your way. Or I decided to say, that's it. You're done. I don't want to deal with you. Guys, what if we, what if God treated us like we treat people? Think about that for a second. Think about it. And so it says, as he said, then I urge you then, since you've done all of this, I urge you then to make me happy by having the same thought, sharing the same love, and being one in soul and mind. A lot of us today, we are only thinking about our own plans, our own this is and our own that. But it's also good to look upon one another's plan. Meaning that it's also good to, to just, even if it ain't nothing, even if it's nothing of significance, send a text and say, hey, thinking about you, praying for you and your desires. Even if it's nothing but that. Amen. Glory to God. That is something that shows that you are thinking about someone else and what God has for them. You know, and sometimes we get in the mode where we say, well, I don't want to bother this person. I don't, they may be doing something, they may be busy. But let me tell you something, beloved. I'm making it a habit as, as now in my life, in the season I'm in. So just send a text and say, hey, thinking about you, praying that everything is well. Amen. Glory to God, because this is how we are to regard people. Amen. Glory to God. And we live in a selfish world. So man thinks about nothing but himself. This is why he thinks about getting rich and doing this and being the best one and, and being this and, and living in competition with the next man because man is always thinking about himself and how can he put himself above everything else. And when I say man, I mean mankind. He says this, don't do anything from selfish ambition. This is Paul writing. He said, don't do anything for selfish gain. Don't do anything because you want to thank you or because you want accolades or because you want them to call your name or because you want them to put your name on a marquee or you want them to give you a certificate or they you want them to say, to say, oh, he is really anointed or she is really anointed or she is really does this. Do it because, hallelujah, it is the will of God for your life. And God has unctioned you to do this and be called to this work. He says it's our cheap desire to boast. Y'all know what that is. When you go, oh, well, remember when? Remember I did this? Remember I said that? Remember I, I, I made this? We're not supposed to do that because our work is supposed to speak for us. That's why Jesus said this. He said that he said, by their fruit, ye shall know them. So if a person is like this, you already know what type of fruit bear on their tree. You know, it's sad to say because we judge no one, but we already know where a person is at 
and that's why that's why we got to pray for people because when we see things like this only god can change it we can't change it only god can so it says this he said but be humble now here's the key it's one of the keys one of the keys to living like jesus or being like jesus is to be humble he says this but be humble towards one another always considering others better than yourself and look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. And so in order for us to set the will of the Lord, we have to be humble. We have to humble first ourselves to God. The word of the Lord says this, humble yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee. And the first thing we have to do is humble ourselves to God, because guess what? God will save us. This is how David penned Psalm 91. It said that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And, and he said, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. And what David was saying in that scripture, he said, I will live under God's shadow. And I, if I live under God's shadow, I'll be able to say that God has saved me. God has protected me. God is my refuge. And this is how we have to humble ourselves to God because God cannot save us unless we humble ourselves to him. God is protection. God is power. God will keep us, but we have to humble ourselves to him. We have to let him do it because if we don't let him do it, then we are at risk in being in charge of our own lives and if we're in charge of our own lives then we will make a mess of it every time we make the wrong thoughts we say say the wrong words we make the wrong decisions we do the wrong things but let me tell you something beloved if you got god on your side and you're submitted to god then the holy ghost will speak to you loud and clear the holy ghost will speak the Holy Ghost will convict you, not only convict you to wrong, but convict you to righteousness. And why do, I, why do I say that? Because people take conviction as a wrong thing. But guess what? You have to have a conviction to serve God. A conviction is simply being convinced without the shadow of doubt. See, in the church, we've used conviction as a weapon. And not really what it's for. Because guess what? You have to be convicted that Jesus Christ is the Savior. You have to be convicted that he's a way maker. You have to be convicted that he can heal. That's how you believe is you're convinced. This is why Paul was able to say, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor principality shall separate me from the love of God. Persuaded. I have my mind is set on this factor. My mind is set here on this factor. I am persuaded. Persuaded. I'm convinced. And this is the way that we are supposed to be. It's humble ourselves before God. That just means turn yourself into God. That means stay in his presence. Because guess what? Psalm 91 said a whole bunch of great things. I'm going to go to it really quickly. but we And I'm going to get back to this, this scripture. But the main scripture of the morning. But. If we li listen to this, listen to this. And it was so, the way God said this, I said, God, you are amazing. So this, this is what happens if you submit yourself to God. Listen, I'm going to go to Psalms 91 and uh, Psalm 91 and, and 2 and 3. It says this, he will keep you safe from all hidden dangers and from all daily diseases. He will cover you with his wing. You will be safe in his care. His, his faithfulness will protect you and defend you. You need not to fear any dangers at night or sudden attacks during the day or place and strike in the dark or evil that, that kill in the daytime. A thousand may fall dead beside you, 10,000 around you, but you will not be harmed. Look and you will see how the wicked are punished. He said, you have made the Lord your defender and the most high your, prote your protector and so no danger will strike you you listen no violence will come near your home god will put his angels in charge of you and will protect you wherever they go they will hold you up in their hands they will keep you from hurting your feet on the stones they will you will trample down lions and snakes fierce lions and poisonous snakes and god says i will save those who love me and i will protect those who acknowledge me as lord and when they call me, I will answer them. When they are in trouble, I will be with them. I will rescue them. I will honor them. I will reward their life. I will save them. That's a lot. That's a lot. 
that God will do if we submit to him. That's a lot. Who doesn't need all that? All great things if we just submit. And then Paul says this as he's talking about what Jesus did. He said this. He said, the attitude you should have is one that of Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God. But he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. So that means that even though Jesus had the nature that he was both God and man, you know, even though he had the spirit of God walking with him, amen, glory to God, and he was the son of God, which is like us, there's no difference. We have the spirit of God walking with us. This is why Paul said, now are we the sons of God? This is scripture. Now are we the sons of God? This sons of God does not mean male, female, this is mankind. Now are we the sons and daughters of God because we have his spirit in us. Now, those that Jesus knew that he was both God and man, he, he submitted himself as a child. The scripture says this, if you do not become as a child, you cannot enter in the kingdom of heaven. If you think about a child, a child's love is not defiled. A child's love is not tainted. They will love you even if you put them in time out. How do I know this? Because me being an educator, there's times I have put my children in time out for doing things. And then right after I said they could get up, they come to me and they hug me and say, I love you. I could be done saying whatever to them and say, you're not doing it right. You're making the wrong choice. Now go to time out. And at the end, they still come back and say, I love you so much. Their love is not based upon if it if it sounds right, if it was this, if it was that, their love is based upon. I love you because you love me enough to take up the time with me. And you told me I could get out. So that means that you love me anyway. You didn't just leave me there. And that's hallelujah. That's how we should be towards God because we've been in many things, in many situations, but God has never left us. He's never cut us off. Never cut us off. I know we I know we saved and then we sanctified and we know that God has filled us, but at the end of the day, we are nothing but filthy rags. Filthy rags. That means that even our righteousness, even as the good works that we've done, even if even if you have ran from sin and stayed away from sin, you still filthy. Still. He's still filthy. But that does not excuse us from being trying to live like Jesus. That's why I said that we are saved by grace. Saved by grace. Amen. By grace are you saved. Not that one should boast. That means not the one should say, I've been saved and sanctified all my life. I've been living. No, you still saved by grace. You're not, it doesn't say you're saved by sanctification. Say you're saved by grace. And grace leads to sanctification. This is the word of God for the people of God. It says this, he took on the nature of a servant. I know these days we got all these titles and everything. And let me tell you something, titles have their place, amen? Because the word of God has titles and people have titles, right? However, in their, within their titles, they were still servants. Paul was called the Apostle Paul, but Paul still took the time to write to his churches and care for his churches. David was called King David, but David still took the time to look upon the people. There are people that took, Queen Esther was called Queen Esther, but she still took the time to dress herself up and go before the king for her people. Servant. Jesus got down and washed the disciples' feet. They were dirty and dusty and everything else and filthy. But he got down and he did it. Every last one. Every last one. And people really, they don't really deal with feet because feet are regarded as the lowliest part of the body. But think about it. A God that came down from, from glory was willing to deal with the lowliest part of you. <laughs> Isn't that good news? 
of a God that came down from glory was willing to deal with the dirty and the lowliest part of you. It says he became human and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death. I mean, that Jesus was able to obey all the way to death. Now, listen, beloved, there was a moment in, in there was a moment in Gethsemane where Jesus was like, I want to rethink this because this is going to hurt. This is going to be hard. And beloved, can I encourage you? The Bible said that Jesus prayed three times. That means that he didn't feel this way once. He didn't feel this way twice, but he prayed three times. Times because he was conflicted in his spirit three times. Beloved, you're no respecter of person. So don't feel bad when you got to go back to God and say, God, I don't really want to do this. It hurts. It don't feel good. It ain't fair. You saw what I had to deal with. I don't want to deal with these people. They made me angry. You saw they were mean to me. You saw all of this. But yet, after that third time, Jesus was able to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So I understand this is what you want. You want this. So I must do this. And that's what God's saying to us. He said, I want this for you. So you must do this. We must do it. And said that he was obedient all the way to the cross. That means he surrendered his life to God. He surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. And it said, because of that, it said, God has raised him to the highest place above all and gave him the name that is greater than any name. And so when we submit ourselves to God, God will make us known among people. Amen. Glory to God. You're wondering where fame and fortune, all that come from and, and, and this and that nature. We shouldn't be worried about that. But we should, I mean, you know, yes, God has given money a place in life. God has given um, connections and networking a place in life. He's given all of that a place in life. But let me tell you, beloved, when somebody knows you, knows that God has something over your life, you can walk into a room and somebody will say, you're so-and-so's boy. Yeah, come over here. I got something for you. Yeah, I can work with you because you're so-and-so boy. I've been knowing your mama. I've been knowing your daddy all down these years. Boy, come over here. Let me get a look at you. I'm going to help you out. I know because I know so-and-so. And she was good to me over the years. And that's how God does us. God makes us known among people. He said, hey, yeah, you. I remember you because you did X, Y, Z. I know you're having this trouble, but I'm going to make your balance look good. We're going to work this out. And that comes from us being submitted unto God. When everybody says, oh, I can't help you, I can't do this, you'll have that one person to say, yeah, say, yeah, I know you, I remember you, something about you is familiar, so I see something in you. And we ought to thank God for that. And so they given, they said that God has given him a name that is above every name. The, the name of Jesus, every knee shall proclaim that he is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so what that tells us is that um, it said that Jesus because he did the will of the Father, this is in uh, Matthew, and I forget the particular chapter and verse, but it said that he was known with God. He had favor with God and man. And this is what gives you favor with God and man is submitting yourself to God. Submitting yourself and walking as he walked. And the good thing about it is, the good thing about it is that there is a blessing that comes from submission there's a blessing that comes from humbleness. There is a blessing. People will tell you, oh, you're going to get your blessing when you get to heaven. Yes, there is a reward waiting on us there. And there is something we cannot experience because we have the experience there. But there is a reward for you, servant. Don't count yourself out. Don't count yourself down. Don't throw yourself under. There is a reward for you. Apostle, bishop, elder, teacher, preacher, evangelist, missionary, prophet. There's a word. There is a something for you. There's a reward. Servant, disciple, whoever you are, there's a, there is something for you. There's a reward for you. Accept it. And 
accept it. This is why God is always making ways for you. This is why God is always doing things for you. This is why God always comes through on your behalf. Why? Because you serve him. But we have to be the ones to accept it. That's why it's called grace. God does not force grace upon us. God, the word of God says this. God has given unto man a measure of grace. That means he's given each one of us a measure, a portion of grace. But in order for you to take it, in order for you to accept it, you got to take it. That's like it's a you go to the doctor and you and you're sick and the doctor gives you a portion of medication. You have to take the medication to get well. But if you don't open the medication and take it, then it's sick. And it can't help you get well because you haven't accepted it. And what I'm saying today, beloved, is you cannot run a progressive race without grace. You have to accept his grace. This is for all of us. For all of us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be unto God. And all I'm simply saying today is in order for us to live a life dedicated to Christ, we have to be crucified with Christ. Crucified with Christ. That means we have to become one with him in his suffering. That means we there are some things in us that we have to say no, no, no. There are some things in us that we have to say yes, yes, yes. There are just some things. So we, we have to be ingrained in that. Don't you know, beloved, the name of Jesus was so powerful that that's why Paul and Silas were jailed because they were preaching the name of Jesus. And they said, listen, we know that he's been risen from the dead, but we don't want you to preach in that name. Because, beloved, even after the resurrection, people were still being healed, delivered, and, healed, delivered, and set free by that name. So they said, no, 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 don't, don't talk about that name. We'll let you go, but quit talking about that name. Because it was a big scandal that Jesus had been risen from the dead because everybody was like, well, what happened? Were the guards not watching? Did he rise like he said? And people were thinking about it. They were like, well, maybe he is. And, the, and they were like, no, we don't want you to believe that. Don't believe that. But guess what? The name of Jesus still prevailed. And you know what? The name of Jesus is still prevailing. Still today. That Guess what? That's why people still don't want you to say the name Jesus in public. They still don't want you to say the name Jesus in schools. They don't want you to do a lot of things. When it, come, when it comes to the state, they don't want to hear the name Jesus. They would rather call on this. They would rather say this generic word, God. Beloved, you got to be careful with that, that generic word, God, because anything can be God. You can assume God to be your money. You can assume God to be your spouse. You can assume God to be your family. You can assume God to be your friends. You can assume God to be any inanimate object. Some worship the stars. Some worship the moon. Some worship every kind of thing in creature. Some worship trees and nature and all kind of things. But let me tell you something. We serve the only God that has ever died and rose again. Our God is the only one that when you go to his tomb, is empty. All the other ones are still in case. They're still in the tomb. But Jesus' body is not there. It's not there. Elijah Muhammad is still there. Buddha is still there. They may be dust and bones, but they're still there. Pharaohs are still there. All of them are still there. But where is Jesus? Think about it. So, beloved, today the altar calls for you. If you don't know Jesus in the part of your sin, if you don't know Jesus, get to know him. The word of the Lord says it like this. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me because my burden is easy and my yoke is light. All of us are, are so ingrained to our smartphones that we ought to use it for good. So, beloved, go to your Play Store. Download the Bible app. Download the Bible app. And read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It has concordance and they help you find it. This is the story of Jesus Christ, who we're talking about today. When you read him, you'll read his story. And it's my prayer, beloved, that you become pricking your heart about who he is. And if you have any questions on what to do, the word of God says this. After you read his story, it said repent. And after you repent, be baptized and after you're baptized and all of these things, it says this. 
You'll be able to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. What are you believing? That Jesus died for you and he rose again. And one day he is coming back for you because you're expected to live a life of change. Change. And if you do that, there is an eternal reward for you. Beloved, this is the altar call. Let me tell you something, beloved. Let me say this. Baptism is not a condition of salvation. Why? Because it's an outward act. But let me tell you, if you confess, or you're able to confess the name Jesus and believe in the name, then that is the only precursor to salvation before live, confessing the name Jesus and living change. Only two things. Only two things. And guess what? The Holy Spirit will he'll come upon you and help you to live the life. Help you to live. Even when life gets hard, he'll help you live the life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be unto God. If you're saved and you belong to a Bible-believing church and you just want to help out, we have ways we can help out. And that's through giving. Lady Davis, will you give us our offertory appeal? Thank you, Pastor Mike. Good morning, Faith and Praise family. Good morning to those that will see us on YouTube. This is how you can help us in, in our mission. But first and foremost, pray and ask the Lord for guidance as to how and should you help us in our mission. Because we want to hear the Lord say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We try to help those organizations to help those that are in need of food. We help, try to help those organizations that help the people that are in need of clothing, shelter, and we even get to those organizations to help families whose children are sick and in the hospital and can't afford medical treatment because we know nowadays this, these medical bills are tremendous. Medical expenses are so high and we try to help those organizations to help those families. So if you feel the Lord tugging at your heart and he's telling you, yes, help faith and praise fellowship in their mission, we have ways that you can do so. We have the cash app, dollar sign FNP 2007. And you can find us there. Search uh, for Faith and Praise Fellowship on cash app, dollar sign FNP 2007. And we also have the Givelify app. Search for Faith and Praise Fellowship on your cell phone or your laptop. And you can help with our mission there. And we have the P.O. Box. It's P.O. Box 78122, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46278-0122. That's Faith and Praise Fellowship Church. P.O. Box 78122, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46278-0122. And so if you'd like to help us in our mission, I want you to know, I don't know how much I was muted, but I want you to know that we try to help those organizations that help people that are in need of food, clothing, shelter, and we also help those organizations to help families with children that are sick and in the hospital. We have no overseas missions because we have so much in need here in the United States. So we do what we can with what comes in. So if you feel the need to sow a seed, send your tithes, send your offering, then please do so, knowing that what we have will help us in our mission now and forthcoming. And I'd like to thank those that have helped us in the past, thank those that are helping us now, and thank those that will be helping us in the future. And we also covet your prayers so that the Lord will continue to send labors to help us answer the call. This is the Offertory Appeal for Faith and Praise Fellowship Church. Apostle, did you have anything else you'd like to add? Praise the Lord. No, praise God. We thank God for the message this morning of the mind of Jesus and let that be, you know, saved by grace. And no matter how or who we think we might be, that God is our all in all. Praise the Lord. One of the things that we used to say some years ago is that we are all of one accord in the name of Jesus. And we just thank God for the word today. Thank God for the deliverer of that word. 
So praise the Lord. With that, we'll go get ready to go into our communion. Praise God.